Hi, I'm Lindsay. And I'm Marshall. Welcome to Tumble, the show where we explore stories of science discovery. This is the second part of Life Lab, our five-part series about how tiny life can change everything. Last time on Life Lab, we heard about how a new field called synthetic biology came to be and where it could be going. If you haven't heard it yet, you probably should go back and listen to it before this episode. Because in this episode, we're bringing Life Lab to Mars. Wait, is there life on Mars? The question is, should we bring our life there? In this episode, we'll be making a packing list for the Red Planet. Before we get to Mars, there's one more thing I keep thinking about that we heard in the last episode. Which is? Well, remember how Chris Prather, the synthetic biologist from MIT, defined the difference between scientists and engineers? If you talk to scientists, then their driver is, what question am I trying to answer, right? If you talk to engineers, their driver is, what problem am I trying to solve? Yeah, I mean, I thought that was an interesting way to put it. So, like, the goal of science is to answer questions, and the goal of engineering is to solve problems. They're different. But I keep wondering, if synthetic biology is about solving problems with biology, how do you choose which problems to solve with biology? Huh. I don't know. Me either. So that's why I wanted to start asking the question with an example of a big, nearly impossible problem. Imagine sending, you know, a, a small village of eight astronauts to Mars. That's Adam Arkin. He's a bioengineer, and this is the problem he's working on. A problem in the future. A future where humans could live on Mars. It takes almost two years sometimes to get to Mars and to get back again. And so you, if you're going to stay there for some period of time, you're on an inhospitable planet, very far from home, with almost none of the services to get you there. Okay, I mean, I think I'm seeing what the problem is. It's hard to live without life. Now, were you on the moon, Amazon claims it can deliver to the moon. You can have Amazon Prime for the moon, right? <laughs> and so you don't have to bring a lot of stuff with you because it can be sent to you when you need it. But when you're two years from any other human inhabitation, when there are no plants and no animals and water is hard to come by, uh, you're on your own. And so either you bring it all with you, which is incredibly expensive and risky because you don't know everything that you need, or you use biology to make things on demand, to reproduce the services of Earth, to create things as you need them. Whoa. So he wants to use synthetic biology to supply a small Martian village of astronauts, which that seems like really ambitious. It does. We'll figure out how Adam plans to make it happen after we take this short break. You know, I talked to a lot of synthetic biologists for this series, and Adam Arkin was the one who came up with the shortest definition of what they do. We make organisms that make new things. I love it. It's brief, to the point. You put it on a t-shirt, and then I would buy that t-shirt. You could market the t-shirt very easily. <laughs> <laughs> so Adam's making organisms to solve the problem of living on a planet without life. And he's broken that huge challenge down into three smaller but still significant problems. Let's just take three simple categories. So you have food, you have medicine, and you have you know, materials to like make your house, for example, and to make the tools and things you need. First, let's talk about food. Adam knows he can't feed eight people the same thing every day. They'll get bored of it. So we need to pack the ability to grow food of various sorts. Now that food has to be adapted to space, grow in very confined areas with very specific light sources. So a Mars garden. Like an olive garden, but on Mars. <laughs> <laughs> Instead of bottomless pasta bowls, they have bottomless dust bowls. <laughs> Would you like more dust? We have plenty. <laughs> yeah. Um, for the Mars garden, you can't just get some regular seeds from the regular garden store. 
they'll have to be engineered for a Martian habitat and then supercharged for astronauts. All the better if that food has been functionally modified. Well, wait, what, what does that mean? It means that the food is packed with more than just the normal nutrients. For example, your potatoes could contain tiny molecules that help keep your bones strong in Mars' low-gravity environment. So you can get more nutrition from it. And even better if it's providing things that we know you need medically. And that brings us to the second category, medicine. How will astronauts get all the medicine they need for all their time on Mars? Everybody gets headaches. Everybody gets joint aches. We know you're going to need things like aspirin or Tylenol. I'm assuming you can't just get, like, one of those massive bottles that they have at the, like, discount stores and take them on the spaceship. No. <laughs> <laughs> and astronauts could get sick with all sorts of different illnesses on Mars. But you couldn't really pack for all the possibilities. So we need organisms that can produce these molecules on demand. Plants are one of them. So like you go to a greenhouse instead of a drugstore. Yep. And there's two ways to make that happen. You can imagine making it in the plant so that you can extract it and make pills out of it. Or you can have the plant be edible so you can eat the plant and get the drug directly. Wait, so you'd be making just like a medicine plant? Not, not medicinal, like, like a plant that's just medicine. <laughs> Yes, you could chow down on a leaf of aspirin, and I don't know how that would taste. <laughs> I, I guess however you wanted to, right? <laughs> That's crazy. It's not just food that can do double duty. So we also make bacteria that are photosynthetic and can reuse carbon dioxide and things like that to clean your air. But they'll also make these drugs for you. So he's trying to make bacteria that will make pills and clean air. Yes, it is really wild. And now we're on to the last category on Adam's packing list, the building materials. Then we have other bacteria that make plastic for us, from which you can make tools, work surfaces, you can patch habitats with it. Okay, so he's trying to do bacteria that makes pills, cleans air, and he wants to make a little army of plastic-making bacteria that's busy building the materials for your Martian home. Yes. And the plan is, is that all of this tiny life settlement gets set up without the astronauts themselves. So a lot of this would be sent to Mars before any astronaut arrives. It would be robotic. Adam told me that this Martian village survival kit would be rocketed out to the red planet, kind of like a rover. So when the astronauts arrived, a lot of things were already booted and operating. Well, that's insane. It can just set itself up? That's the idea. It's the ultimate off-grid technology. In fact, Adam says we could easily convert this Martian village system to benefit Earthlings still on our planet. This whole thing fits in something the size of your backyard. So you can imagine feeding two or three families, providing resources for them here on Earth, with nothing but the sun and the atmosphere and water and your own household waste. I think that's a huge benefit to mankind. Okay, so we could all use this crazy Martian technology, but right in our backyards. Yes. And, you know, a lot of technology developed for space missions has ended up being used on Earth. Like, did you know the Dust Buster was first designed in order to collect moon dust? <laughs> Really? <laughs> I guess, like, if it can get dust on the moon, then it can definitely get those little crumbly things that are in the couch. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. <laughs> but getting back to Mars, what Adam just laid out is a synthetic biology solution to supporting astronauts on Mars. They'll use the power of DNA to convert bacteria and plants into tiny factories that make supplies on demand. But when it comes to how this would actually work in real life, there are some kinks to work out. Take food, for example. And it's actually not entirely clear <laughs> how we ensure that there's always food at all times and it always grows with no error. Wait, it's not clear how they make sure the astronauts always have food? See, that sounds important to me. <laughs> Don't know about you. <laughs> You want to have food all the time, like every day, right? I mean, 
Around two or three times, sure. (laughs) So there's not exactly a grocery store that you can go to if your crops fail. So making sure there's no bad growing season is extremely, extremely important. Especially when no one's ever grown a plant on Mars before. I mean, how do we even know how that works? Yeah, and that's not all. Moving on to medicines, these pills, or pill plants, have to be as good as what you'll get on Earth at the pharmacy. Our pills are made in big factories with lots of tests, making sure they don't accidentally harm you. How do you make machines that do that? And we kind of know how, but not enough to guarantee it. And that needs to be solved by the time we go to Mars. All right. So that doesn't sound to me like it's just like a little kink in the plan that needs to be worked out. It sounds like it's actually like a really huge problem that could mean life or death for an astronaut. Yes. And that puts a lot of serious responsibility on Adam and his team. We have to make sure that we just don't cause any problems. Okay. But how do scientists know if what they're going to do will cause problems? The short answer is that they don't. And biology is complicated. And because it's complicated, we have to be very careful when we use it. (laughs) Well, how do you make sure you're being careful? Well, Adam is constantly thinking about what can happen. We figure out for every step what could go wrong. And we then, for every technology that is about that risk, we assess how can it go wrong? How can it be fixed? What happens if it can't? Do we have a backup technology? Sounds like they're trying to stop things from going wrong. Definitely. But beyond the technology, there's bigger questions to ask about how we bring ourselves and brand new biology to another planet. We are a people about to embark into an unknown location and plant our flag out there. And we are taking a privilege to go to another planet and assert our biology and our dominance in that world. Wow, that's a really interesting question that asks if we even have the right to live on Mars at all. Is it okay to colonize another planet, even if no life exists there? That is an excellent question. And there's an even bigger one behind it. There's a larger question about what is our right in terms of getting out into the world. And there's two things to consider here. One is there's a huge amount of cost for us to go out there. This costs the world a lot of money. These are billions upon trillions of dollars that could be spent elsewhere uh, to help our people. And we have to justify that in some way. We think about, is it worth that cost for the benefit we'll deliver to our people back on Earth when we do this? It's an ethical statement we're trying to make. An ethical statement means, is this a good decision to make? How does going to Mars and bringing our new biology with us measure up to what we think is right and wrong? Meaning, why do we think this is a problem that we should even put effort into solving? Exactly. There are no right or wrong answers. Ethics are about what you believe in and what you value. We all believe in and value different things, so we can all think through the same questions with the same information and come to different answers. Well, I mean, what does Adam think? What's his answer to that question? Honestly, I'm a technologist uh, and a scientist, and I'm most concerned with the fact that we are clean. (laughs) That is, we do no harm, that we don't contaminate the planet. Basically, he has a job to do, and he wants to do it well. He believes that synthetic biology can be contained and not affect Mars in a bad way. And he thinks it's possible to make it trustworthy enough to support his small village of astronauts. I want to make sure that we are doing the job that everyone expects us to do and nothing more. That's my main concern. But he admits that not everyone would agree with his job. Now, going to Mars as a people, as a human race, as a human animal, is debatable. But I can't imagine not wanting to explore I can't imagine us as a species wanting to cut ourselves off from the universe we live in. Okay, so he does think we should go. He definitely has a case for it. I think that going to Mars is an immense undertaking that will increase our knowledge by leaps and bounds. It's a, it, just an amazing thing. But it could be a place for us to live one day. And I'm not sure we're going to do that, 
but not knowing if we could seems like a mistake. That sounds like a pretty compelling argument. I'm not sure what to think about it, though. Me either. On one hand, I'm like, if we need to solve problems on Earth, why don't we just do that and not have to <laughs> figure out the part of how do we get these things to Mars? <laughs> yeah, but then you don't get to go explore space, which, I don't know, is like, that's really cool, a good enough reason. <laughs> <laughs> we could go back and forth on this forever. But at some point, we have to decide what to do. So how do we do that? That's what we're going to find out in our next episode. We'll be heading to the home of a Harvard professor and his eight-year-old daughter. And this father-daughter team is going to attempt the impossible to figure out how we make good decisions about science together. Should we do this or should we not do this? Or I'm kind of in the middle. I don't know which one we should do. Maybe we should, but... Very carefully. <laughs> or maybe we shouldn't, but very carefully. <laughs> yeah, right, right. That's next week on Life Lab. Thanks to Dr. Adam Arkin, professor of bioengineering at the University of California, Berkeley, and scientist at Lawrence Berkeley National Laboratory. He's also the director of CUBES, which stands for the Center for the Utilization of Biological Engineering in Space. Good acronym. Yes. Life Lab is supported by the Engineering Biology Research Consortium, a nonprofit committed to educating the next generation and building a community dedicated to solving big challenges with engineering biology with funding from the National Science Foundation under award number 2116166. Special thanks to Emily Orend in India, Hook Barnard. You can find a transcript and other educational materials about this episode on the blog on our website, sciencepodcastforkids.com. Learn more about life in space on our bonus interview with Adam Arkin. It's available to Tumble patrons who pledge just a dollar or more a month on patreon.com slash tumblepodcast. Our interns on this project are Elliot Hajaj and Grace Ingram. Eric Kuhn is our engineer and mixer. Sarah Robertson Lentz edited the series and designed the episode art. I'm Lindsay Patterson, and I wrote this episode. I'm Marshall Escamilla, and I did all the scoring and sound design for this episode. Tumble is a production of Tumble Media. Thanks for listening, and join us next week for part three of Life Lab. <laughs>